Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. So we had a busy day yesterday, didn't we? Lots of news coming out, most of it centered on Jean-Luc Brunel, and the fact that he was swooped up by French authorities trying to board a plane to Senegal. Now, We know that Jean-Luc Brunel was a key cog in the Jeffrey Epstein machine. And we know that he has committed conspiracy crimes, allegedly, not only in France, but in the United States of America. Now, it's very difficult to extradite somebody from France. They're very against that sort of thing, like I was talking about earlier. but. A Twitter user pointed out that sometimes, if they're pressured, that they will extradite. So, again, who knows, right? I would hope that they would if the charges are more serious in America and he would, you know, face more jail time in America, then yeah, hell yeah, extradite him. But if the French authorities have the goods on him and he's going to do time in a French prison and it's serious charges, and it's serious time. Honestly, I don't really care where this guy does his prison time, be it France or America, as long as he faces the repercussions of his actions, of his behavior, as long as the people that he abused get justice. Now, Again, I am not too hip on the French judicial system. I don't know how severe their penalties are for for, uh, crimes such as these, but I do know that the Roman Polanski situation leaves a terrible taste in my mouth. And it really makes me hesitant to think that the French would ever pony up Jean-Luc Brunel. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think he's not going to be charged or prosecuted, I think that the French people are going to demand that. But as far as extradition goes when it comes to Brunel, I am of the mind that France will not get in bed and extradite him. Then again, who the hell really knows, right? Who knows what sort of behind the seal deal, deal, uh, behind the scenes deal making occurs or is occurring as we speak. But the fact of the matter is this. Jeffrey Epstein's two top lieutenants, two top commanders, two top co-conspirators, Ghislaine Maxwell and Jean-Luc Brun- uh, Jean-Luc Brunel are both spending the night in jail cells tonight. Sure is a far way from where we started, isn't it? When Jeffrey Epstein was first arrested for the second time around, nobody expected it to bloom into what it has become, especially after the first go-round, especially after the way they flubbed things up. So there was a lot of people, me including, and a lot of people thought that this was going to go the same way as it had always went, that nobody would be held accountable, there'd be some lip service played for the survivors, and the Department of Just Us and Darth Barr would bury it. Well, things took a drastic turn, didn't they? Folks like you started to get really fired up about this. And when I say really fired up, I mean steaming mad. And the cries for justice and the cries for a true investigation became so loud that they could no longer ignore them. And now here we are. Over a year later since Epstein's death. And that whole entire cell has been shattered. And when I say that, folks, I mean the operators on the ground. We can get into the nuances of the enablers behind the scenes, of course. But I'm talking about the actual cell. The assets on the ground have all been shattered. 
Epstein, dead. Maxwell, prison. Jean-Luc Brunel, in a jail cell. The core four staring down the barrel of what I think are sealed indictments with their names on them. So things are starting to fall into place. And I, I, you know, I said recently that I, I believe things are happening behind the scenes. And I think this is just another bit of foreshadowing with Brunel getting swooped up the way he did as to what we have coming down the pipe when we're talking about the rest of the associate, the associates involved, uh, meaning the core four. So that's where we're at with Brunel right now, folks. That's where we're sitting at. That's what's going on. And I would expect there to be a lot more news coming out about Brunel from the French newspapers. So I will definitely be all over this case. I will uh, continue to you know, break it down every time there's some new news to share. We'll add it to the catalog and we'll just keep this ball rolling like we always do around these parts. So, tonight's article, however, is a doozy from Chris Spargo over at OK Magazine. And according to Chris Spargo, Jeffrey Epstein's estate and Indyke and Khan have been ordered to turn over all of the video recorded at his houses. Now, I understand that this is a big ask, right? And it would it would be determined by what the estate actually is in possession of. My question is, how can we be sure that they're being honest when they give an accounting of what sort of video they are in possession of? And also, what has the FBI swooped up and put into the evidence chamber? You have to think that the FBI, during some of these raids, everywhere but Zorro Ranch, has picked up uh, an enormous amount of evidence, video and otherwise, and they have it stashed. So, I don't know how much video that the estate has, but whatever they do have, well... The United States Virgin Islands and Denise George, well, they want it all. And once again, Chris Spargo is bringing us the goods from down in the United States Virgin Island. And I think that this story will get missed amidst the the Brunel hype and the Brunel um, fallout from his arrest. So I wanted to get this added to the catalog so that we had this on record because I think this is a uh, another big ask by Denise George and I think it adds to the profile that she's building of all of these people, every single one of these people that were really close to Epstein were really involved. And that's the profile that she's been building, and that is the premise that she's working on with this Seco case. And as we're going to see tonight, it just keeps building, folks. It keeps on growing. Our article is from okmagazine.com. Headline, Mega Dump. Jeffrey Epstein estate ordered to turn over all video recorded in his sex den. Darren Indyke was also told to hand over information about finances and secret trusts. This article was authored by Chris Spargo. Now, this is a big deal, right? It goes right in to what we have been talking about with the Finson files, what we've been talking about when we discuss all of the offshore shenanigans and financial uh, douchebaggery that is occurring. And this goes right into it. What do you think? Denise George isn't onto it the same way we are? You What, you think the SDNY isn't hip to what's going on here? Now, the SDNY is keeping their investigation much closer to the chest, considering they're in a criminal investigation, right? They're playing it a lot closer to the vest, a lot cooler, and a lot more undercover. Denise George, on the other hand, is firing off subpoenas like Arnold Schwarzenegger was firing off machine guns in Predator. 
She is not messing around. Everybody's getting subpoenas. It's like being on an episode of Oprah when she's giving shit out, bruh. Everyone's getting it. And Indyke and Khan are getting piled on. Prosecutors in the Virgin Islands have served a subpoena on Darren Indyke, the executor of Jeffrey Epstein's estate. There are 33 requests in all, far more than any other subpoena issued in the ongoing civil suit, including one for all video and audio recordings from or of any property owned by or for Jeffrey Epstein or any Epstein entity of Jeffrey Epstein or of any female associated with, employed by, or alleged to have been sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein. Holy cow. That's a a big ask, right? And again, I appreciate going for the throat. I appreciate Denise George and her grandeur here. My question is, do they have anything that they'd be willing to turn over? And how would Denise George go about compelling them to do so? It's very interesting to watch to the watch the push and pull between the estate and Denise George right now. So I'm very interested to see what comes of this subpoena. It's another, another slap for Darren Indyke as well. Now, we know recently he was able to dodge a deposition and postpone it. But for how much longer is this guy going to be able to duck and dodge these questions? How much longer is it going to take to have Darren Indyke under oath and speaking with the prosecutors and the FBI? Not in the capacity as an executor, by the way but as uh, in the capacity of uh, a person of interest, because let's not cut the cake short here, folks, okay? That's exactly what Indyke is. Indyke has intimate knowledge of Jeffrey Epstein's behavior and all of his financial dealings. And I promise you, as we sit here tonight, folks, if you put the screws to somebody like Darren Indyke, He is going to sing you a little song. And there is no doubt he will be rolling over on everybody involved. Anything to get himself a lifeline. No other person knows more about Epstein and his private dealings than Indyke, who served as the convicted pedophile's private counsel for close to 30 years. Yeah, Chris Spargo's once again dead on here. Chris Spargo is once again dead on. That's exactly what Indyke is. Indyke isn't just some lawyer who was hired on, right? Indyke is like Saul to these guys. You know how Saul Goodman was for uh, Walter White and Jesse Pinkman and Breaking Bad? Same shit here. Intimate knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes. And in fact, his fingerprints meaning his signature, is everywhere on business dealings. Never mind the 97 trips to the bank for structured withdrawals. Never mind all of that. How this guy is not arrested already is its just beyond me. Prosecutors are now asking that he turn over that private information in the subpoena, which was issued earlier this week. It was Virginia Roberts who first confirmed that Epstein recorded people at his properties and even described the control room where a guard watched all those video feeds in the front room of Epstein's $88 million Manhattan mansion. And we know after the fact that many other people came forward and talked about how he had a eye in the sky room, a surveillance room. And if you've ever worked in a position in Las Vegas or another gambling house anywhere in the world, I'm sure, and you have had to go into a surveillance room before, you know exactly what's going on in there. TVs everywhere, got somebody monitoring everything that's going on, and everything's being recorded. So I am sure that's what was going on in this case. And when Epstein wanted it to be intimate, security was told to hit the road. 
I know what I'm doing. Don't worry. That's the Epstein model, right? And I, I can't even imagine what sort of depravity and, and just complete horror was recorded by these cameras. FBI agents, along with members of the NYPD, were also able to obtain some recordings when they stormed Epstein's townhouse in July 2019, shortly after his arrest. And other raids as well, right? The Palm Beach raid, they got some stuff, I'm sure. Um, Obviously, New York. But for me, the golden goose is, was, and always will be Zorro Ranch. It just screams that they're hiding something by not raiding this place already. I mean, what is the holdup? And, and, and furthermore, what is the problem with the local authorities? Imagine being the local district attorney and not ordering this place being raided or going to a judge and, and getting everything ready to go so you could raid this place locally if the feds don't want to do it. It's an absolute travesty that this property has not yet been raided. What secrets are hidden in that home? What secrets are hidden on that property? Names have been redacted, but Indyke is being asked to turn over communications with over 50 individuals, a full accounting of Epstein's financial records, and the details to a number of trusts that until now had remained a secret. Oh yeah, look, we'll... We know, all right, everybody who listens to this podcast should know anyway, that Epstein and Maxwell and the rest of the crew had offshore accounts for a war chest for these sorts of purposes so that they can conduct things in a clandestine manner. And some of those companies are now coming to light. Some of those offshores are now being talked about. But for every one that Epstein had, I would guess that there are three or four hidden in the shadows still. Request number one. All documents and communications reflecting or related to arranging, obtaining or changing the immigration or marital status of any female associated with, employed by, or alleged to have been sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein. This includes, but is not limited, to your contacts with any attorney, government entity, or any of these females related to visa, residency, or citizenship applications, marriages, or divorces. And we know how they used those kind of marriages to get citizenship for people. We've heard that. We've talked about that. And again, Denise George is really leaving no stone unturned as she pursues Darren Indyke and the estate here. And I'm loving every minute of it. Every minute of it. Request number two. All documents and communications reflecting or related to efforts to provide arrange, or pay for counsel for or to secure immunity for any employee, agent, or associate of Jeffrey Epstein. This includes, but is not limited to, redacted, 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 and redacted. It's like a a rap song, right? Yo, 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 it's redacted. So there's going to be a lot of redactions in this, okay? And you know that a lot of the people that are being mentioned in these filings are survivors. So I'm not so mad about these redactions per se, but it's funny to read all of those redactions in a row like that. Request number four, all documents and communications reflecting or related to travel to or from St. Thomas or Little St. James or visits or visitors to Jeffrey Epstein in the Virgin Islands. So if you visited Epstein or any sort of communications to, and you traveled from or to St. Thomas or Little St. James 
and your name is documented in any of the paperwork or documentation that is in the possession of Darren Indyke and the estate, get ready because your name's about to get dragged into this shit if Denise George has her druthers. Request number five. All documents and communications related to the purchase, development, or environmental status of or protections for Little St. James and or Great St. James. I, I was remember reading about some sort of environmental issue about, I want to say some kind of lizard or something. I don't remember exactly what the environmental hubbub was about, but there certainly was some kind of issue about Epstein and clashing heads with environmentalists over something. Request number seven. All documents reflecting or related to any communication with any financial institution regarding, on behalf of, or as an agent for Jeffrey Epstein. Yo, that's a big one. Anything that he acted as a beard for, right, as an agent for, they want all of that documentation. I hope he kept those ATM receipts when he was taking out 7,500 racks out of clip. They're going to want that documentation, homie. You better have it. Because this civil case can very quickly turn into a criminal case in the Virgin Islands. Remember that. If Denise George, I mean, if she if she really wants to, I'm sure she could pivot that way right now even. So I'm interested to really see when all of this has been brought forward, when Denise George has all of this evidence, I'm interested to see how aggressive she becomes in a criminal manner. And I guess a lot of that will also depend on what goes on in the SDNY. This includes, but is not limited, to contacts with American Express, American Foreign Exchange, Deutsche Bank, Banco Popular, J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Bank Lumi, and First Bank. All such reputable monetary institutions, such great lending institutions. They've never been involved with any sort of money laundering or scumbaggery or uh, having to be saved by the citizens of the United States and elsewhere, have they? No, not them. But during a global pandemic where people are literally struggling to put food on the table, have any of these banks reached out to anybody and offered to knock half of your finance rate off? For a few months? Have they offered to do anything for anybody besides maybe freezing a payment or two that you're going to end up paying on the back end anyway? Of course not. Because these scumbags don't give one single good goddamn about anything but increasing their wealth, increasing their power. And all of these banks that were involved with Jeffrey Epstein or any of these other sex traffickers or any other sort of absolute stain on society should face severe criminal penalties. And I'm not just talking about the bank as an institution facing penalties. I'm talking about the people in charge. The buck has to stop somewhere. If you're going to get a $160 million golden parachute when you leave your job, you better be damn well sure that you're going to be held liable when your company is in bed with people like Epstein. Request number nine. All video and audio recordings from or of any property owned by or for Jeffrey Epstein or any Epstein entity of Jeffrey Epstein or of any female associated with, employed by, or alleged to have been sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein. So any video at all. And if they say they don't have any, then you know that they're lying. Denise George wants it all. If there's a video of some CCTV footage of someone walking into a room, she wants it. Walking out of a bathroom, she wants that too. You got some video footage of someone having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the kitchen, you better pony that footage up as well. And Denise George is just, she's really kicking in all the doors here, right? I I really respect her gusto in this matter. 
Request number 12. All documents and communications provided to or reflecting individuals who stayed at, redacted, including instructions or welcome letters provided to those individuals. Again, anyone who stayed at whatever this redacted place is, I'm guessing one of the properties, including instructions or welcome letters provided to those individuals. So you know like when these rich people go on one of these like trips, they'll get like an introduction letter, like an itinerary, you know, shit like that. I'm sure that was happening at Epstein's for these rich people. So Denise George wants all of that as well. Any sort of intro letter, any sort of itinerary, anything you got. It's time to come up, pony up, and turn it over, Indyke. Request number 13. All documents and communications reflecting cell phones, travel, bank accounts, credit cards, health care, or legal services arranged or paid for or provided to females associated with, employed by, or alleged to have been sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein. So, again, building the profile here, right? Cell phone travel, cell phone records, travel records, bank accounts, credit cards, health care, legal services. This is how you build that profile of saying that Epstein was trafficking these girls, that Epstein had them under his control and was providing uh, these different outlets for them as they were being trafficked by him. And that is exactly what's going on here. That's what, that's, that's the case that Denise George is trying to make here. And all of these subpoenas will act as, um, a way for her to collect these receipts to prove with evidence that's more than circumstantial her case in a court of law. Request number 21. All documents and communications related to or reflecting the establishment purpose activities, investments, employees, income, or expenditures of financial trust, Southern Trust, and Southern Country International. Now remember, those are the big ones that he had down there, right? Those are the big money laundering joints, in my opinion, in my estimation. And those are the places where people like Leon Black were heavily invested and heavily involved. So I'm really... Really, really curious to see what happens in that kind of situation. Leon Black can't be having a good Christmas holiday, folks. He can't be feeling good about all of this. And with all of these other subpoenas fire getting fired off and Indyke being in uh, imminent jeopardy here, you, you got to think it's a uh, an uncomfortable Christmas for Mr. Leon Black. And guess what? It should be. Request number 26. All documents and communications reflecting or related to the flights and passengers of any plane owned or leased by Jeffrey Epstein. This includes, but is not limited to, all flight logs and passenger manifests. Again, huge. A huge clue, and it will go down as big-time evidence when all of this stuff is turned in, if it's turned in, right? But... She is not kidding around with this stuff. She is definitely not kidding around. And Indyke and Khan and anybody else involved better take Denise George and her investigation seriously or they're going to find themselves getting cold cocked with a sucker punch. Request number 30. All documents and communications related to redacted or redacted redacted and redacted, and redacted, related to activities on or affairs of Little St. James or Great St. James. I don't have much to add there. Everything's redacted. Can't really, uh, can't really spitball about that one, can we? Request number 32. All documents and communications related to or reflecting any tax management or avoidance efforts by or through Jeffrey Epstein included, but not limited to, through the purchase or sale of art. Oh, well, what do you know? Art comes up again, huh? We've been pounding, pounding that avenue. 
here on this podcast. Art is a huge avenue and vehicle for these money launderers, not just Jeffrey Epstein, by the way, for a lot of these money launderers, a lot of these um, people who are involved in trying to avoid taxes. The art world is one of their favorite places to park their loot. And we see it again here. Denise George is hip. She knows what's up. She knows the deal. And if you think she's not going to investigate the art world and the involvement of these people within that art world, you're not paying attention. This subpoena is likely to be the last one issued ahead of the civil trial, which is set to begin next year. Prosecutors are working very hard to keep the details private, and a motion was filed in court this week, stressing that most matters in this case are confidential and should not be shared with individuals who are not directly involved in the proceedings. Yeah, this is a a hush-hush case, there's no doubt. There's a lot of private matters going on, especially considering the payouts through the fund. So... I don't know how much we're going to hear like uh, leak wise in this case, but we'll do what we always do, right? We'll read in between the lines. We'll add meat to the bone and we'll certainly stack that context on top of that context until we're surrounded in a building made of context. Darren Indyke did not respond to a request for comment. Indyke has been mentioned throughout the court documents for the role he played in helping Epstein access large amounts of cash and paying off young women. Indyke, I I don't know how he survives through this as far as not going to prison. I really don't know how. This guy has been involved from the jump, folks, and we're not talking about from a distance. Epstein made a number of large transfers and withdrawals in the years before his death, according to previous court filings. An email sent to the judge overseeing Epstein's probate case by Virgin Islands Chief Deputy Attorney General Carol Thomas Jacobs detailed a number of these suspicious transactions, which also landed Deutsche Bank in hot water. Now I'm referring to... Um, that, excuse me, they're referring to those transactions that I was talking about earlier, at least in part, the ninety-seven, seventy-five hundred dollar withdrawals. That's structuring, folks. Okay, that's to avoid Title Thirty-One and to get over, get around CTR paperwork. Thomas Thomas Jacobs uses the complaint filed against Deutsche Bank by New York's Department of Financial Services to illustrate why the court should not be entertaining demands for more funds from Epstein's trust for his executors. Over the course of the relationship, Mr. Epstein and his representatives used Deutsche Bank accounts to send dozens of wires directly and indirectly, including at least 18 wires in the amount of $10,000 or more to alleged co-conspirators who had been subject of past press reports, states the DFS filing. And if you're sending anything over $10,000, you have to fill out that that paperwork or it's considered structuring. You're going to get a SAR for that in most situations. And where, where, where I worked, you wouldn't be getting your money and you wouldn't be putting any money in until I got that paperwork. So this is a big deal. I know it seems like it's pedantic and stupid and procedural, but it really is a big deal in the financial world. Indyke, who identified as attorney number one in the below passage, per Thomas Jacobs, also began withdrawing large sums of cash. Look, again, I don't know how much more clear I can be about Indyke. Now that Jean-Luc Brunel has been swooped up, and the core four are in the crosshairs of the authorities, I think it's time we pay more attention to Indyke. And I think that it's time to really do the full court press on Indyke. I would really like to see this man, at the very least, have to give a deposition under penalty of um, oath, right? If he, if he lies, perjury. At the very least, that's the first step that needs to occur here. In my opinion, it should be a whole hell of a lot more. But let's we could start there, right? Let's get him in there. Let's get him in the chair. Let's let's talk. Let's get a talking going. A little a little bit of a conversation with the FBI. And let's see. 
just what Mr. Indyke knows. When later questioned why attorney, excuse me, attorney one withdrew $100,000 in cash on behalf of Mr. Epstein. When later questioned why attorney one withdrew these sums from the bank, attorney one reported that Mr. Epstein needed the funds for tipping and household expenses. Tipping and household expenses, huh? What is Jeffrey Epstein running around like Henry Hill at the Copacabana? Sliding hundies in everyone's pocket that walks in his door? Stop it. We know he, he wasn't that. We know that he wasn't detaching himself of money in a generous manner ever. Tips and household expenses. You mean hush money. In total, in roughly a four-year period, Attorney One withdrew on Mr. Epstein's behalf more than $800,000 in cash from Mr. Epstein's personal accounts. And then, like usual, in the article, you can go and check out these court filings for yourself. So, make sure you check out the description box. But the profile has been built here. The blueprint, the blueprints are clear. It's very obvious that Indyke was acting on Epstein's behalf when he was taking out all of this money. What happened to the money afterwards? Where's the paperwork on it? Where's all the documentation on it? And really, the real question that I ask and that is in my mind after we read this article and we know everything we know is, when in the hell is Darren Indyke going to be removed as an executor of the estate and become instead a guest of the state. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at Bobby Capucci at protonmail.com. That's B O B B Y C A P U C C I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B O B B Y underscore C A P U C C I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. And to everybody who has donated to the podcast and who helps keep the lights on around these parts, thank you folks very, very, very much. I appreciate each and every one of you. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for us tonight. I will be back tomorrow, excuse me, later on tonight, and we will pick back up where we left off. All right, everybody, please enjoy your afternoon.